Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much to Ellis and the Architecture Foundation for inviting me to be a part of the Book Week in 2023. I'm delighted to be able to um, talk about my book, Modelling the Metropolis, the Architectural Model in Victorian London, which was published earlier this year by GTA Verlag. Um, the book comes out of a, uh, a PhD and a research project at the Victorian Albert Museum um and is is based on a huge amount of kind of uh, unexplored primary material both objects at the museum but also uh, documents print culture individual uh, archives um newspapers magazines um court summons and things like this um the probably the best place to start is to quote John Summerson, who described the period of the book, which is roughly from the 1830s until the First World War, as uh, a period in which London had uh, been more, um, had never been more cut, never been more reformed, never been more uh, rebuilt, reconstructed at any other period in its history. And it's precisely that this period that the book explores, thinking about how architects used and thought through models in the reconstruction of the city and in their engagement with uh, politicians, clients, social commentators, and this emerging um, public at large. And um, the book is organized spatially into seven chapters. The first chapter really does begin at the beginning uh, in the 1830s with um, this idea of the public sphere that's emerging very much um, all across the Western world at this time, especially in uh, Britain. The 1832 Reform Act changes British society in its enfranchisement of voters. And with this enfranchisement, with this new political um, base, architects in the design of public buildings engage a lot more, not just with the aristocracy, but with uh, politicians and with the parliamentary constituents. And the book begin, moves into this space thinking about how architects use models as tools of rhetoric, uh, as well as kind of, should we say, poetic or creative devices to uh, design new public buildings in the city. Um, it looks, the chapter very much looks at individual examples of particular models, how they were deployed uh, as rhetorical aids to um, assist in the kind of persuasion of architects with their clients uh, or in committee meetings. But it also looks at how uh, they were mediated throughout society, how print culture, so the model you see on the left is uh, the model you see uh, in the background of uh, this etching in this engraving and um, looking at how uh, models mediated through society through images how they perform certain roles in um, symbolic roles in civic functions um, how they became a means by which the public engaged with um, with the, the changing city that was going on through the 1830s and, and 40s as well as debates in um, in in, in uh, the newspapers and this model in particular caused a whole series of uh, discussions in the main mainstream press in, in the summer of 1840. Um, it also begins to look and think about competitions, the major, a uh, major feature of Victorian architectural practice, and we could argue Victorian practice, uh, architectural practice still today, that there is this idea of, of meritocracy, that anyone can enter into a competition and uh, present their work and models were often considered one of the best means to communicate an architect's intentions before um, the kind of costly business of construction um, there are kind of mass exhibitions of particularly important projects like uh, the royal courts of justice in the 1860s um, and we begin to as well see how architects are presenting models in one location at a, say um, a kind of uh, a public display of, of competition entries, but also using photographs to then mediate uh, and, and present their images elsewhere, like at the um, Royal Academy or at other architectural exhibitions around uh, London. And these models as well are kind of uh, 
offer us a record of the buildings that weren't built. As many of you will know that this project isn't built. Seddon's project wasn't built. There was another project by uh, George Edmund Street that was. And so we, when we, we examine these models, we see kind of uh, counterfactual histories, histories that didn't necessarily happen to London's built environment. Um, and interesting, this model and this project definitely wouldn't have fitted onto the site. Uh, so in some ways, it's good that they didn't even start to try and build it. Um, we also begin to see how other parts of architectural culture uh, explored models or used models to kind of discuss ideas. So whilst uh, this um, the Royal Courts of Justice was in competition and then um, in the design phase before construction, um, it was a huge um, figure of debates in within the architectural profession. Um, and what you see here is two um, significant figures of architectural culture in the 19th century, James Ferguson, uh, in particular on the left, um, firing acid at a model of the winning entry for the Royal Courts of Justice by George Edmund Street with the crowd of the of the, the kind of all the grandees of the architectural profession behind uh, blindfolded blind to the kind of um, the style of the building that's being presented uh, to them and this is a, a poster for a, um, a, a party at the Architectural Association made by the students and here models are shown uh, to kind of symbolize particular um, social cultural ideas within the architectural profession and as again this kind of uh, figure of, of certain um, designs. The second chapter moves perhaps from the public public sphere more, uh, more purely into um, Parliament, into the, the House of Commons and the House of Lords to look a little bit more about how central government used architectural models in the planning of the city and also how architectural models became a part of debates within um, Westminster politics. So on the one hand, we have these large scale urban models that become to be constructed of key parts of London. So Whitehall, um, the embankment, um, parts of the Strand. Um, these models take place just a kind of 10 years, a kind of generation just after um, London is mapped through the Ordnance Survey. Which is as a, which Linda Need, amongst others, has argued as a way that um, London's sanitation and hygiene becomes um, more regulated. I argue in the book that through these architectural models, the urban spaces of the city, uh, the new buildings of this imperial uh, government, become constructed and controlled, and then presented to the public through uh, exhibitions at. Parliament in, in, in public parts of Parliament, but also then at um, these kind of new formed institute, artistic institutions around the city. So the South Kensington Museum, um, now the VNA in the in, in West London, but also Bethnal Green Museum uh, in East London now. Um, in a young um, and these models move around the city showing these new designs for uh, in this case this um, kind of imperial promenade from Trafalgar Square to Parliament Square, um, showing a whole new proposed construction of um, concentrated government offices, uh, showing areas where underground railways could be constructed, as well as the kind of monuments um, of, of the city. Um, I talked uh, in the first chapter, I talk in the first chapter about the first Reform Act from 1832. There's another Reform Act, the second Reform Act in 1867, which again doubles, uh, doubles the um, population, uh, the voters, the number of voters again. And then a third Reform Act in the 1870s, again, almost doubling the number of voters. And these propel British society into the age of mass politics. One of the questions becomes at Parliament, if who is going to pay for these? Um, who is going to pay for these new buildings? These large concentrations of offices that are necessary for the administration, both of London, central government, but also um, the British Empire around the world. And agendas around leveling up are very much present in the third quarter of the nineteenth century, um, as models become a key part by which provincial MPs debate and try to cost cut and push. Um, particular agendas around architectural design uh, in this period. And we see this, say, in a pair of models that still survive, that you can go and visit them in Portcullis House, um, of designs for the Admiralty and War Office by the um, 
a pair of architects from Yorkshire, not so well known, who um, these models appear in various select committees. They um, become kind of key aids by which the government interrogate how the building is going to be built, how the building has been designed, how they can save money by reducing the amount of ornamentation on it at various points, how the lighting will work in the various uh, bureaucratic uh, spaces of this building. Uh, and by the end of the 19th century, the um, George Atchison, the RBA president, talks about through these models and describes in his presidential address, an architect cannot put up a monumental building in the hope that the public will, have, will approve of it and pay the expense. The most they can do is show a drawing of a model, a dr so a drawing or a model in public and persuade men in power or of immense wealth that they are both capable and original and will be able to charm the public by their work. And architectural models become this central feature by which uh, these kind of major uh, moves of political economy, these major moves of um, social power get uh, enacted in society. And the architect is a kind of key part of this. And we also see, so if we just switch back for a second, uh, the one end of this this photograph shows this, this site model for Trafalgar Square. The other end is Parliament Square. What to do with Parliament Square is a long running question in um, urban design and, and, and in architecture in, in Britain. Um, and these models that I'm talking about in the book are not just, shall we say, scale models at one to 100 or one to 500, but also they come at one to one and they are, you know, mock ups. And what we see here is a timber mock-up of Cleopatra's Needle, um, not um, on the embankment by the River Thames, but at Parliament Square, where um, whilst the um, original artefact is being transferred by sea um, from Egypt, a timber mock-up is placed in the ideal position of this um, for this monument, a kind of monument of transnational imperial power for Britain. Uh, uh, and it's placed in the site in order to kind of judge the scenography and the kind of urban design of this object in, in relation to the other uh, spires. Uh, these are published, um, many of these images as well are published, so even if you don't go to London and see this object, you, people from around the country and around the world are viewing uh, these images. Uh, the only problem being that um, the site of the Cleopatra's Needle was right above the uh, district and circle lines and uh, the cut and cover construction of the tunnel couldn't take the point load so they had to move the um, they had to move the position of, of, of the of the obelisk. As I've talked a lot about ideas around um, um, rhetoric and the way in which models are used to, or were used to persuade uh, in kind of various political forces and clients, the third chapter goes and looks at the courtroom itself and legal cases and architectural models in legal cases, and in some ways questions um, existing writings of architectural history and architectural theory, which are often just around design, that the, what the architect does is design, whereas this tries to offer a kind of uh, a viewpoint that there are other practices going on, other social practices going on within um, Victorian society that architects are involved in. So um, it explores the ways in which architectural models come into courtrooms to help um, deal with the emerging legislation that this city that london has developed over the 19th century there's new legislation around density around party walls around easements around rights of light and architectural models become a key way in which when these disputes go to court architects are brought in to explain situations to magistrates to um, to lay juries through testimony oral testimony you know the main vehicle of um, British legal system, but also through architectural models that explain things. And what we see here on the left is an artist just, just showing us um, a, 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 a kind of image. It's this complete happenstance that an artist recorded this. Um, there was a, a new building being built just next to Crosby Hall in, uh, in the city. Crosby Hall is now not here in the city. It got rebuilt in Chelsea, but that's another story. Um, and but what's happening is there's a dispute around. Uh, we see this this scaffolding and this party wall here, and a new model got a model got made showing um, when the when the project when the 
the case went to court about who exactly owned which bit of this party wall of this medieval building. Um, the model maker made a model that went to court. There are two architects appointed from, um, from the prosecution and the defense. And then there are various parts of the model that are brought in to show the judge or the magistrate, sorry, exactly uh, which bits of the building were owned by which party and who should pay for their construction or their demolition. Um, this, 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 these models also affected the architecture of the courtroom itself. So this is a courtroom in Durham, not in London. But what we see in here is the installation in this new assize courts of a special wheel that gets placed in the middle of the courtroom by which architectural models can be positioned, they can be brought up, they can be turned around, they can be displayed. And this happens all across the country and of course in various courtrooms in London where models become a central way in which um, architects are used to communicate their professional expertise to, uh, to magistrates and to, uh, and to juries. Uh, the fourth chapter moves to think about the spaces of the exhibition and ex exhibition culture more, uh, more specifically. So um, this is probably my favourite model from the whole book. Um, this is a model uh, that was presented at the Great Exhibition in 1851. It's a model that's made by the Liverpool Architectural Society. They, um, they and their student assistants go around the whole of the city, measuring and surveying and measuring the whole, every single building in the town. And then they make a series of, um, um, the scale is something like one to 240, I think. Um, and they, 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 they measure every single building and then they construct this absolutely enormous model. We can see, um, see how big it is. Um, judging by the people viewing it. It's in the main, uh, the central space, the main uh, trans, the main nave of uh, the Crystal Palace. And what this model does is it shows us, as well as you know, every single building in the city, it shows us the major monuments, the town hall, St. George's Hall, um, uh, Lime Street Station, and the whole of the dockyards all the way along the River Mersey, every single dockyard and every single warehouse and what this model does, I argue, is that it's about, on the one hand, you know, it's this architectural society who would travel from Liverpool to London to present this object to a kind of world public. But also what it, what it shows us is um, it shows us the connection of Liverpool to a nation through this railway and through Liverpool Lime Street and these kind of major monuments that are connected to, to Britain. But also it shows us this, um, the ability of a model to also connect to kind of much bigger ideas. So if we, if we see these dockyards, what we're looking at is actually the connection, a kind of transnational connection from Liverpool to the major sources of wealth that had brought, that were brought into the UK, obviously much of which through the enslavement of people, but also the trade and the extraction of raw materials from all around the world. And this object um, can be read. It shows us how models can be read in, in, in many, many different ways through their presentation in, uh, in, in exhibitions. It also, look, the chapter looks much more specifically at the practice of one or two architects. So um, there's a, a large section that explores um, the idea of redecorating St. Paul's Cathedral in the, in, the, in the third quarter of the 19th century by William Burgess. Um, there is this idea that the state, this is kind of the state of um, St. Paul's as unfinished by Wren is a national scandal. Uh, William Burgess is appointed um, to, um, to kind of design a new interior scheme where they would overclad the existing um, Portland stone with kind of a Cinquecento polychromy um, decoration. A whole series of very, very expensive and artisanally produced models are presented at the Royal Academy where their presentation causes such a storm, such a kind of storm of controversy that the whole project end up, ends up getting cancelled and binned. Um, <clears throat> there are all sorts of problems. There are problems the public or also the architectural profession see in terms of the Christian symbolism, this kind of high Anglican symbolism. Um, a very kind of uh, Roman symbolism through this decoration, um, but also with the way the models are made themselves. So you'll see this model, a photograph of the model on the left, it's a section cut, 
And this, of course, means that light comes into the model from the wrong places because of the section cut. And this, various architectural critics complained, gave this very unrealistic um, impression of a model that's trying to be a, a deeply realistic presentation. There's also the problem that the clustery windows at the top were made um, with opaque rather than transparent paper, so there's no light coming in from the top there as well. And it ends up with this enormous storm where after having, after the, the the chapter and the dean of the cathedral have spent thousands and thousands of pounds on these models, they end up stripping them um, from the model itself, sticking them in a, in a scrapbook, and then the model gets used again in another way later. Um, but Burgess, even after his, his commission has been cancelled in, um, in 1874, he still doesn't give up, and he appoints um, Axel Haig, the kind of um, uh, the kind of uh, the preeminent renderer of the day to produce a whole series of architectural drawings that then get exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1875. And these images give the the kind of the realism and the the kind of um, they invoke the atmosphere that um, that that Burgess wanted to present, but it's too late and he's and and, and he's, his project has been cancelled and they show us the, these this model and this example shows us this tension between um models and drawings within um architectural practice in the 19th century and how different commentators at different points mobilized ideas of truth and honesty um within within debates on the kind of the fidelity of these different forms of representation um Perhaps this is an example that people might be more familiar with, but it also the chapter also looks at another uh, model that's shown um, at the Royal Academy at the end of the 19th century by uh, Edward Pryor, Edward Schroeder Pryor. And the chapter really argues that this model, which Pryor makes with his own hands, he produces it himself. It is a essentially a sculpture made from an artist. Um, marks a change within architectural practice where um, architects are encouraged through different types of model making materials to um, translate their conceptual ideas through the physical act of model making and the presentation of that publicly and this position puts them on par prior and others believed with the position of sculptors uh, and painters in the royal academy and forms this much more um, autonomous position for architectural practice, where it's not about the translation of a series of drawings or even translation of a drawing into a model, into a drawing, into a building, but rather um, this very, very direct relationship with the act of building itself. And it kind of contrasts, uh, the, the, the chapter contrasts these different approaches by different groups of architects or different individuals uh, through this Royal, through the Royal Academy exhibition as architectural practice changes in, in the 19th century. The question of who makes these models comes up a lot, and the fifth chapter really move, tries to move into this space to try and understand who is producing architectural models in the 19th century. Why? Uh, what are their disciplinary backgrounds? How much are they being paid? How can we find space for them within this um, world of architectural production. Um, it draws on two examples, but the major one that half the chapter looks at is the work of Annie and John Thorpe, a pair of model makers working uh, in Gray's Inn Road in, in, in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. Um, they Thorpe, John Thorpe is an architect who then realizes <clears throat> that it's much more lucrative to become a kind of subcontractor of blueprints, of copies of, of, of contract drawings and of eventually architectural models. Um, he realizes that making the sort of models for legal cases that I showed you earlier um, is an incredibly lucrative business. And so he moves his uh, workshop from the city to Gray's Inn Road. He's much closer to the, the community of um, the legal community in London, and he begins to make endless different types of models for, um, for, for these clients. But he also begins to work on kind of projects of his own. He's making models for architects themselves, or they're making models for architects themselves, but he's also making this very strange model of old London, 
which is made of five or sometimes six parts. Um, it comes out of a whole series of kind of antiquarian study that tries to reconstruct an image of early modern London before the Great Fire. Um, Parts of it that you see on the left from the flyer, parts of it can be hired for parties. Maybe the next time the Architecture Foundation has a party, they could hire um, a bit of Dunthorpe's model. Um, and it's in it very it, 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 it's this it's this kind of interesting example of different types of architectural agency within model making. Um, but it's also um, fascinating in the way that this object, um, which does survive a bit although it is separated, it's in the Museum of London. Um, this, this object gets deployed at various international expositions um, in the early 20th century. So the Franco-British exhibition in White City in 1908, for instance, where it's presented to the world. And one of the, there are kind of two things people talk about it and the, you know, architectural commentators talk about it. On the one hand, they talk about it as this incredibly accurate, well-researched antiquarian kind of preservationist resource for kind of an emerging body of heritage and, and, and people thinking about the history of the city. But also on the other hand, they recognize or it's recognized that it's this um, moment of genesis, that it is this, this early modern London is this moment of the birth of, you know, a, a birth of commercial capitalism. And if visitors from um, elsewhere in the Anglophone world, kind of settler colonialists from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, come back to London to visit, to see the exhibition, they can learn about the history of um, British commercial imperialism, I suppose, however we want to put it, through coming and studying this model. And it's, become, it's this moment of genesis in that way by which um, a kind of greater idea of British culture can come together through, um, through this object. The sixth chapter, moves to the university and the kind of emerging ideas around architectural education um, in, 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 the, in the long 19th century, thinking about how architects as professionals began to form institutional groups, but then dictate how and where they should learn about architectural practice, um, kind of supplementary to um, modes of pupillage, this kind of internship-esque um, approach that was the major form of architectural practice uh, before university education. Um, <clears throat> the chapter looks at early model making manuals that came in to supplement some of the kind of on-site, on in-office training that architects were learning within um, practice, within this pupillage system, as I described, um, something like uh, Bernhard Heinrich Blasch's um, The Art of Working in Pasteboard, is a part of a wider culture and society of um, knowledge transmission from Europe into the UK. In particular, this book is translated and published in the UK. At the same time, a whole number of anatomical um, model, uh, anatomical manuals are being published uh, from translated and published from Italian and German into the UK. And this book shows you how to essentially make a Doric temple uh, through uh, cardboard. These books, these handbooks that supplement education become um, even more um, sophisticated across the course of the 19th century. And in response to this kind of growing public culture of competitions, um, there is this new and emerging body of architectural uh, assistants who have to make models for competitions. And the art of architectural modeling is published in 1859 that shows, um, that shows young people um, shows assistants how to make an architectural model and it moves all the way from tools and materials because it shows you how to make your own cardboard um, to exactly to a kind of a step by step guide of how to exactly make uh, an Italianate villa. Uh, you see the villa on the left hand side and then it shows, it shows us the, the, the drawings that you would have to make in order to um, begin to produce the walls, the, plan, um, the, walls, the floors, uh, the roof, um, etc. Uh, and it tells you how to where to procure certain things like uh, you need to go to the chemist to buy the mica for the windows of, of, of such a model. Um, but the chapter also very, very specifically looks at um, 
architectural models and their role, their kind of didactic role within the education of architects um, at University College London, at King's College London, and um, at the AA um, in, in various different guises. And it, it, it uses um, some surviving photographs and it uses a huge amount of um, research uh, in various archives and in uh, in newspapers and architectural journals to help reconstruct how architects use models in different points. Sometimes models are there to explain particular um, stylistic or ornamenta ornamentational uh, ideas to architects, aesthetic ideas, but also to help them understand about technical things. Uh, sometimes these technical things are long-standing ideas around, say, timber construction, but also a lot of them are about the new proprietary um, methods of construction that are taking place all across building sites in London. And people need, you know, students need to understand how these new ventilators, uh, windows, zinc roofing systems are being deployed uh, and they learn about this in these kind of museum spaces um, before they go out into the world and have to uh, specify uh, and detail them. Architectural models also take on a role at different times on kind of field trips where um, the AA used to have a field trip uh, every Wednesday afternoon, I think, and they would take students out. And when they go and see Westminster Cathedral, uh, the cathedral is still at kind of basement level and it's being constructed. This is right at the start of the 19th century. But the students go and they visit the very famous model of Westminster Cathedral that helps them understand despite the smog and the gloom of, of, of a November day in, in London, it helps them understand um, the building that is um, the building that, that that will rise up through viewing this architectural model in the in the foreman's um, offices on, uh, on Victoria Street. Um, the final chapter looks and moves towards the museum. It thinks about um, not so much collecting histories, but um, the desires of, of architects in collecting and forming architectural collections of models uh, in different spaces. So um, a space very, very famous, I'm sure, and many of many people will know, is uh, the model room at Sir John Soane's museum. And this chapter looks at two or three different iterations of um, the of, of the of the spaces of the model room uh, within Soane's house, how different types of objects were moved around, acquired uh, and deployed within different settings, how the architecture of the room itself was adjusted at different ways in order to produce certain lighting effects um, in the room. Um, but it also looks to this uh, kind of emerging public education that's taking place. So it, in particular, uh, it looks at the South Kensington Museum, um, or the, the series of museums that formed the South Kensington Museum um, in the 19th century, looking at how um, these, there are two stylistic divisions that are made, classical and Gothic within the museum. You see the, the classical section on the, on the right, where uh, the museum presented a whole series of uh, plaster of Paris models of antique buildings that had previously been owned by John Nash in these kind of um, screened um, subdivided galleries, each uh, organized into chronological time periods, um, surrounding the kind of scaled object of about one to 50. There are one to one fragments of ornamentation of the buildings themselves, and then photographs of the buildings in their current um, dilapidated state. And the purpose of this was to obviously build connections across through different forms of media for people as they experienced these buildings, but weren't actually in um, Turkey or in Greece. But also um, the purpose of these spaces was to provide a kind of public education to change taste and to change the kind of quality of art and design within the UK um, through media, through the medium of the copy. And models formed a really, really crucial um, part of that. Um, you can uh, you can buy the book. Um, you can buy the book. It's at the RBA bookshop. It's um, it's in the AA bookshop. It's um, it's on Amazon and other uh, online retailers, I'm sure. But you can also go onto the Verlag's website, which is at the bottom, and there's an open access PDF. Um, that you can download and have a read. The book itself is 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 a very uh, nicely designed object from some Swiss uh, graphic designers in Bern. Um, but you are also very welcome to kind of try before you buy and have a look at the open access PDF and um, 
yeah, I'd be really interested to know what everyone thinks about it.